Hi and welcome to the Windows Kernel Programming Fundamentals course here on Pentester Academy. My name is Pavel and I'll be your guide throughout this course. Let's now examine some of the properties of kernel device drivers. So kernel device driver called always executes in kernel mode, which means it uses the kernel mode stack of a thread. As you might recall from perhaps an earlier course, a stack of a thread in kernel space is very small. It's roughly 12 kilobytes on 32-bit systems and 24 kilobytes on 64-bit systems by default. So we need to be careful not to use too much uh, stack space. The image is part of system space. So it is part of the higher address space, the, the upper 128 terabytes, for example, on 64-bit systems. Any unhanded exception will crash the system with the infamous blue screen of death. And so the idea here is that if I have the full power of the kernel, I need to be responsible for what I'm doing and anything bad that's happening is going to crash the system. And this is not a punishment, this is a way to protect the system from potential damage. Typical driver files have an extension of sys although that is not really mandatory and the extension doesn't really mean anything in kernel space. However, this is the common extension to use and there's no reason to not use it. Typically, drivers are invoked by client code, as we've seen, by calling functions such as read file, write file, and device side control once we get a proper handle uh, to these drivers, to the appropriate device. And so, the way driver works, one once it's loaded, there is a main function of the driver that's being called, it's called driver entry, and its main purpose is to export entry points or tell the kernel what operations are supported by this driver, such as read, write, create, plug and play, and so on. Technically, there's no need to use assembly language when writing drivers. This is never necessary in Windows. You can always use C or C++ for writing drivers by calling the appropriate APIs within the kernel. If you do need something which is specific to the hardware, you should typically find the proper function within the hardware abstraction layer or HAL that provides everything that you need. That said, you can always go ahead and use assembly language because nobody can actually stop you. You can do anything uh, within uh, the kernel. And so if we look at the Process Explorer, it's just a quick uh, example here. Here's Process Explorer. Let me go ahead and show Process Explorer uh, on this screen. And if we go to the system process, so the system process is where all the kernel components are, including all the device drivers. And so if you go ahead and look at this lower pane and switch to DLL view, what we will see actually are all the device drivers that are currently loaded into system space. So these are all the drivers that are currently on my system. You can see that most files have a sys extension, although again, this is technically not mandatory. We can see the path to these drivers. Typically, it's in the drivers directory under the system32 directory, but technically it can be anywhere. We can see the base address of the module loaded into kernel space. We can see the address is very uh, high, which means it is in fact in the upper 128 terabytes of system space. So here's Process Explorer, for instance. Here it is. You can see that, uh, in fact, this is also one of the modules within kernel space. Also, the kernel itself is also sort of kernel module. So you can see ntorskernel.exe here. It, this is just yet like another a kernel module, just like any other module. And so you can think of the kernel as just yet another driver in one sense or another. And the fact that it has an ex extension means really nothing. Uh, again, extensions have no real meaning in kernel space. And the same goes for the HAL. And so the HAL is also part of kernel space, but it has a DLL extension. Again, that really means nothing. Um, any extension would actually do. But these are the classical extension used for the uh, kernel and the HAL. So everything is in kernel space. Okay, so there are other types of drivers, such as plug-and-play drivers, which I'm not going to discuss in this course, of course. However, just know that these types of drivers have some 
uh, category on their own. And so we can separate these to three types of drivers that are part of any plug and play system. So one of them is called the function driver. So for any hardware device, there should be a single function driver that actually manages the functionality of that device. This is a driver typically written by the hardware vendor that understands the device intimately and knows how to make the device do its thing. And then there, are, there is a bus driver, which is typically written by Microsoft to manage the bus where that uh, hardware device uh, is located, such as uh, PCI, USB, Firewire, PCMCIA, and so on. So typically we don't need to write these kinds of drivers. And then there are filters. Any driver can have uh, filters. Some of the filters may, may sit on top of the function driver, and these are called upper filters, and drivers below the function driver are called lower filters. So again, these all uh, uh, plug and play stuff is beyond the scope of, that, of our course, but just I wanted you to kind of get a brief introduction to what plug and play uh, drivers uh, consist of. And this brings us to the way we write drivers in Windows. So how do we write drivers? What kind of models do we have in Windows today? And so the classical model is called the Windows driver model or WDM. And it has some historical uh, reference or historical significance. So in the old days, when there were two kind of lines of Windows operating system, there was Windows NT and there was consumer Windows with Windows 3.1 and then 95 and 98 and so on. And so in the 95 and NT4 days, if I was a hardware vendor trying to write a driver for some hardware that I, that I created, I had to write two separately, completely different drivers. And that was very annoying because I had to learn two different models for writing drivers and then do proper testing on Windows 95 and NT4 and I had to rewrite two completely source code bases for these types of drivers. And so the idea of WDM that came in the Windows 2000 and Windows 98 timeframe was to unify this driver model so that hardware vendors don't have to write two drivers. They can use single source for the driver and then just compile that once for Windows 2000 or XP and then compile that again for Windows 98 or Millennium Edition at the time. And that would make things a lot easier for hardware vendors. And these types of drivers were supported for many hardware device types such as PCI, USB uh, devices and many others. That was really a good idea that made things uh, easier for hardware vendors. And it was also possible to extend that to future buses, so stuff that could be uh, created in the future, such as, such as USB 3 or, or stuff like that. It also supported many types of hardware device classes, such as uh, human interface devices, such as mice and keyboards, uh, scanners, cameras, and lots of other stuff. So generally it was a good idea at the time, and it still can be used today, even though the benefit of having uh, the ability to create drivers for Windows 98 is no longer uh, interesting for anyone. And so WDM is still, still remains the fundamental model of writing drivers in Windows and can still be used today for really any type of driver. Now WDM was somewhat limited because it actually took the Windows NT4 and 2000 model and created a simulator for that in Windows 98. And the problem was that simulator was limited in some sense. So there were some types of drivers that just couldn't be uh, created for, uh, for by using WDM, but they had to be specialized for Windows 95 and uh, or 98 and Windows 2000. So for example, file system drivers were completely different. Uh, drivers for graphic cards were different because graphic cards require very complex drivers that couldn't be really encapsulated in, the, in the, this model of WDM. Now, today we have a new model called Windows Driver Framework or WDF. It was previously called Windows Driver Foundation. It was introduced in Windows Vista and currently it's actually open source on GitHub. Uh, 
So this model is actually a layer on top of WDM in, 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 in the kernel's uh, case. So we have two parts to that. One of them is called the universal, sorry, the user mode driver framework, which is the model I mentioned earlier for writing user mode drivers, which you don't care about uh, in this course. The second part, the kernel mode driver framework or KMDF, this is the layer that was created to sit on top of WDM to simplify some of the stuff going on in WDM. So WDM had issues. It was a very good idea at the time, but it did have some issues. For example, all the plug and play and power management code that drivers had to implement for hardware devices was very complex to implement and, uh, or, or at least implement correctly. And so uh, a better idea would be to create the common plug and play and power management code as part of a framework and this is one of the things that KMDF really provides. And so KMDF implements power management and plug and play code correctly and the driver only needs to register for the interesting things that it really needs to know about such as when the device is coming online and, and things like that. And that makes the life of the driver writer much easier. Also, the, the API itself became more consistent with KMDF. It's uh, object-based. There are sort of properties, methods, and events. Now, it's still pure C, so it's not object-oriented in the classic sense, but it is easier to understand and more consistent in terms of the way the API is built. There's also some other stuff, such as object life management with internal reference counting and the ability to run drivers with side-by-side uh, -side support based on the version that the driver was compiled with and tested with. So generally, if you're writing today drivers for hardware-based devices, you want to use KMDF if you need to write a kernel driver for that purpose. You don't really want to use the classic WDM. However, for drivers that are not uh, handling any hardware, such as classic software drivers like the one from Process Explorer or the ones we're going to write in this course, KMDF is an overkill and doesn't really have any significant advantage since we're not going to use any plug and play or power management code and the object model for KMDF is really geared toward these types of drivers. And so we're not going to use WDF in this course, we're going to use pure WDM because again, there's just no benefit of using that. However, if you do get uh, the need or um, the, the chance to write a driver for a hardware device, then KMDF is definitely the way to go. So in this module, we've seen the basics of the IO system and uh, the components that make up the IO system. We then took a look at uh, device drivers and see how we can communicate with devices by using user mode APIs. And then we looked at device driver models, basically WDM and WDF, where we have KMDF and UMDF. And KMDF, as we mentioned, is a replacement for WDM, which we're not going to use because this is mostly for hardware-based drivers. In the next module, we'll start to get into the actual details of how to write a device driver, and by the end of the module, we'll write a very simple device driver. Mm -hmm.